If you are a nursing student in nursing school or you're preparing for the NCLEX and you want to know, you want to learn about the difference between respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis, this YouTube Live is for you. It is my intention to share with you some concepts, to talk to you about causes, nursing interventions, and of course, we will have the opportunity to practice and click style questions. So welcome everyone. If you're new here, go ahead and comment on the comment section where you are joining from and welcome everybody around the world. I hope that you can hear me well and you can see the presentation. So let's begin respiratory acidosis versus respiratory alkalosis. All right, the first thing that I want to share with you is some general concepts or definitions. So respiratory acidosis, what we see is the total concentration of buffer base is lower than normal and there is a relative increase in the hydrogen ion concentration. What does this mean? In order to understand any type of problems with acidosis, alkalosis, whether it is respiratory or metabolic, you have to understand the balance between hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. As we know, we have a perfect system, a perfect body that tries to compensate all the time whenever something is going wrong. It is called homeostasis. In order to maintain a proper balance, well, there are buffer mechanisms and there are different systems that help compensate. For example, the respiratory compensation and the renal compensation. But we'll talk about that on another live. Let's focus today on respiratory acidosis and respiratory alkalosis. What are the causes for respiratory acidosis. What can happen in the body to cause the problem of respiratory acidosis? If you see the first name is respiratory. So it means that there is something going on with the respiratory system. And basically it is primarily caused by defects in the functions of the lungs or changes in the normal respiratory patterns. So if there is a structural problem with the lungs or the respiratory patterns changes, we can see a respiratory acidosis problem. Other conditions that can cause respiratory acidosis are obstruction of the airway leading to hypoventilation or depressed respiratory system. Ahora, now, what are some known causes of respiratory acidosis? We see asthma, atelectasis, brain trauma, chest trauma, bronchiostasis, bronchitis, central nervous system depressants, hypoventilation, pneumonia, pulmonary edema, and pulmonary emboli. But what I want you to think, <coughs> sorry, what I usually see nursing students do, they try to memorize everything. And I'm not saying memorizing is bad. It is okay. As a matter of fact, you have to memorize certain nursing concepts and it is okay. But everything cannot be memorization. You have to understand what is going on physiologically or pathologically with your patient. So the first thing that I want you to think is, as you read and see asthma, atelectasis, brain trauma, bronchiostasis, bronchitis, think about what is going on, why these conditions can cause 
a respiratory acidosis. For example, let's use asthma. What is going on with asthma that a patient that is asthmatic, that has an asthma problem, can develop or could develop respiratory acidosis? What is going on with asthma? Well, basically, the patient can have spasms, irritants, allergens, that causes the smooth muscles on the bronchioles to constrict. And what happens if we have excess bronchial constriction? Then this is going to affect the gas exchange. It's going to affect that exchange between oxygen and CO2. Remember what we talked about the primary cause of respiratory acidosis. There is a malfunction, something is going on with either the lungs or the respiratory patterns. So in this scenario, in the asthma scenario, we have something going on, an irritant that is affecting the bronchioles and we see that bronchial constriction. Now, what is going on in atelectasis? Why a patient with atelectasis can have or develop respiratory acidosis? Well, we know that in atelectasis, there is an excessive mucus collection that makes those alveolar sacs collapse. And if those alveolar sacs collapse, we have the same problem again. We have an ineffective gas exchange. Now, brain trauma. How come? Why can a brain trauma cause or lead the patient to develop a respiratory acidosis? Well, in brain trauma, because of the brain trauma, there could be or there could develop an excessive pressure on the respiratory center or the medulla oblongata and so on. You need to identify the whys of nursing rather than only doing this. Oh, okay, asthma, telectasis, brain trauma, chest trauma, bronchiostasis can cause respiratory acidosis. That is not enough. You have to ask why. What is going on in the body that these conditions can lead the patient or can take the patient to a respiratory acidosis. Now, on the NCLEX, you could see a question that they give you the diagnosis. They can give you a question that states a patient arrives to the ER or is being treated in the ER and the patient is being diagnosed or has been diagnosed with respiratory acidosis. But you could see different style of questions where they're not giving you the diagnosis and still you need to intervene and still you need to identify what are the proper or appropriate nursing diagnosis. But in those scenarios, instead of giving you the diagnosis, they give you the clinical manifestations of the patient with a respiratory acidosis condition. It could say that the patient came to the ER with this problem, hypoventilation, hypoxia, confusion, dizziness, lethargy. They might tell you that the patient has a history of respiratory problems, like for example, COPD. Now, why you need to understand the clinical manifestations of respiratory acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, or any other condition. Because in order to treat the patient, in order to intervene properly, you have to understand what is going on. So one of the neurological clinical manifestations we can observe in a patient with respiratory acidosis is lethargy, confusion, dizziness, and even 
in severe scenarios, we can see coma. What are cardiovascular clinical manifestations of respiratory acidosis? We can see decreased blood pressure or hypotension. We can see dysrhythmias. And I ask you, why? What is the relationship between respiratory acidosis and dysrhythmias? Because we go back to the same concept, understanding why. Why? The patient has respiratory problem, respiratory acidosis. Why is the heart being affected? Why can the patient develop dysrhythmias? Well, it's very simple. There is a compensatory mechanism whenever the patient develops acidosis. And that compensatory mechanism is an exchange in between potassium and hydrogen ions. So we have, if we have a patient with acidosis, we have too much hydrogen ions in the bloodstream. Well, there needs to be a compensation. And what happens, there is an interchange between hydrogen ion and potassium. This is very interesting. And the patient can definitely develop dysrhythmias due to hyperkalemia. And you may think, well, but why? why? Why hyperkalemia? Well, think about this. The exchange is, is in between hydrogen ions and potassium. So if we have a condition known as acidosis, what we know is that we have an increased concentration in hydrogen ions in the bloodstream. So if we need to compensate, then hydrogen ions need to go inside the cell and then potassium exits the cell and goes inside the bloodstream. And what happens if we have too much potassium coming into the bloodstream, then we have an increased concentration of potassium in blood and that is called hyperkalemia. And if the patient develops hyperkalemia, that can cause serious problem to the heart muscle and therefore can cause dysrhythmias. But now you start to understand the whys of nursing rather than once again, just saying, oh yeah, respiratory acidosis, dysrhythmias. I know that. You need to understand why. On the neuromuscular side of the clinical manifestation, we can see seizures. And on the respiratory side, we can see hypoventilation and hypoxia. Anytime, anytime we have a problem, a respiratory problem, we could see that the patient can develop some type of pattern of respiratory pattern in order to compensate. It is, a, it's a, it is a quick mechanism that the body does automatically to try to compensate. So we can see hypoventilation and hypoxia or hypoxemia. Now we know now some of the clinical manifestations, but what are we going to do? What are the nursing interventions if a patient has developed respiratory acidosis. What are we going to do? Well, one of the important nursing interventions is to assess for signs of respiratory distress. We have to identify what is the oxygen saturation. We have to do an arterial blood gas and confirm how are the other parameters and be very careful. If the respiratory acidosis is too severe, then the patient could even need endotracheal intubation or mechanical ventilation. So we have to assess for respiratory distress. We have to administer oxygen as needed. Be careful with oxygen and patients with COPD. We could do a change in position, change the position to high Fowler's 
position. Teach the patient to cough and deep breathe. Hydration to help thin secretions. Avoid administering tranquilizers, sedative, or opioids. Why? Well, we talked about depressing the respiratory system. So any medications that causes depression of the central nervous system, depression of the respiratory system, we have to avoid them. Administer respiratory treatments as needed. And of course, if we know that the patient can develop hyperkalemia, then monitoring the patient with an electrocardiogram or continuous cardiac monitor will be extremely beneficial. Completing an arterial blood gas and serum electrolytes, especially potassium, it is very important. Now, these are general nursing interventions that you could perform in a patient with respiratory acidosis. But remember, as the NCLEX gets more difficult with the NCLEX style questions that are above the passing standard, you could see scenarios that say, which of these four nursing intervention is the priority? And they could include some of these answers that you're seeing here. And then you're facing a scenario where you're saying, but this is difficult because answer A, B, C, and D makes sense. I can do all of that in a patient with respiratory acidosis, but then you need to identify what is the priority nursing action. In order to prioritize, then we have to switch gears. You have to use a prioritization strategy. And if you don't know about prioritization strategy, I encourage each one of you, if you haven't done so, find our seven day training where I talk about prioritization strategies and critical thinking. That is key to passing the NCLEX. What are medications that we can administer in patients with respiratory acidosis? Well, we have bronchodilators. If the patient has bronchospasms, then we can give bronchodilators to help those bronchioles expand and it's going to help with the exchange between oxygen and CO2. We saw that that could be one of the causes. Antibiotics to treat infections in the respiratory tract. We could give medications, respiratory agents to decrease the viscosity of pulmonary secretions, such as acetylcysteine or mucomis. Now, the next step, I want to show you a question. This question, it is not too difficult, but you need to identify first the ABG. You have to interpret the ABG. And if you miss our last YouTube live where I taught the tic-tac-toe strategy and showed you how to interpret an EKG, an, a, an ABG, I'm sorry, I showed you that strategy to help you identify and interpret an arterial blood gas the correct way. It is an excellent technique to use. So use that if you already know how to do it or if you use the wrong method or whatever method you know to interpret an arterial blood gas, use it to identify what is going on here. And then you need to identify which nursing intervention is the nurse going to implement. Once you have the answer, go ahead and put your answer in the comment section and tell me why. So not only give me an answer, give me the answer, but then say why. This is my reason why. So I can review the comments and identify if you're thinking the right way. So the client diagnosed with pneumonia has an arterial blood gas of a pH 7.33, a PaO2 of 94, and a PaCO2 of 47 and bicarbonate is 25, HCO3 is 25. Which intervention should the nurse implement? 
The fact that they're telling you that the patient was diagnosed with pneumonia, it is a hint to let you know that we probably have a respiratory condition in this ABG interpretation. Because the bottom line is that the patient is diagnosed with pneumonia. As we review or interpret the arterial blood gas, we see that the pH is 7.33 is below the normal level because normal pH is 7.35 to 7.45. So we have acidosis. Something is going on. This pneumonia is causing an acidosis problem because the, the pH is below 7.35. We notice the O2 pressure, it is 94. This is normal because normal PaO2 is between 80 and 100. The PaCO2 or the pressure of CO2 is 47. We know that normal values is from 35 to 45 and anytime we have a CO2 above 45 and the pH below 7.35, then we know that what's causing the acidosis is the CO2 in a respiratory problem. So we have respiratory acidosis with a normal pressure of oxygen, but now we have to look at bicarbonate. What is the ACO3 doing? The ACO3 is 25, so it is within normal levels. So we have a problem of respiratory acidosis and bicarbonate is not trying to compensate or at least is normal. So there is no compensation or post partial compensation. So what do we have in this scenario? We have uncompensated respiratory acidosis. If you apply the tic-tac-toe strategy, I hope you got to that answer. Uncompensated respiratory acidosis. You see, if you are not able to interpret this ABG, you're stuck and you won't be able to know the answer. Because anytime they give you an ABG to interpret you, that is the first step. So now we know respiratory acidosis uncompensated. What is the nursing intervention that I should be doing right now? We look at answer number one, it says, Administer sodium bicarbonate. Well, we have a respiratory problem and we have respiratory acidosis. The thing is that if you know content and the administration of sodium bicarb, sodium bicarbonate, it is administered in metabolic acidosis, not respiratory acidosis. So answer number one, we can eliminate. We have answer number two. What an important answer. Administer oxygen via nasal cannula. And I know that many of you love this answer because you have been taught over and over that anytime you see oxygen, that's probably the answer, but I am here to tell you that this is incorrect. Not always oxygen is the correct answer. It depends on the scenario. And I ask you, why do you think they're giving you a pressure of oxygen that it is normal? Do you think that measurable information is there for no reason? Oh no. They're giving you that information for some reason. And it is to tell you that the problem here is not oxygen. Because at least for now, the pressure of oxygen, it is normal. 
So I do not need to administer oxygen. Answer number two does not make sense at this moment. Now, this doesn't mean that the patient could decompensate even further and then start having oxygen problems. That can happen too, but that is potential. It hasn't occurred yet. We have left answer number three and four. And he says, answer number three, have the client cough and debrief. Hmm, what an interesting answer. And answer number four states, instruct the client to breathe into a paper bag. So as you can see, we have two answers, answer three and four, that deals with breathing. One says, cough and debrief. The other one says, breathe, but breathe into a paper bag. So which answer is the correct answer? But I want you to think of the original problem. The original problem is respiratory acidosis uncompensated in a patient diagnosed with pneumonia. So you have to think that we have an increased amount of hydrogen ions, CO2 in the bloodstream. So I ask you, if I tell the patient, get a paper bag, put it around your mouth and breathe into the paper bag, what is going on with the CO2 that the patient is exhaling? What is going on with that CO2? It's remaining in the paper bag. So the patient, anytime he's going to take a deep breath or inhale, CO2 is coming back in. What happens if the patient already has increased CO2 in the bloodstream? And now we are doing this intervention where the patient is going to continue inhaling CO2. This is going to cause a further problem. Breathing into a paper bag is not recommended for respiratory acidosis. That is recommended for respiratory alkalosis, which is the next topic that we will be reviewing today. So answer number four does not make sense. The correct answer is number three. And you may say, Professor Bud, oof, I could think of many other nursing interventions that I could do that will help this patient. Why three? Simple. If you use the process of elimination, answer number one, two, and four does not make sense. Maybe three is not the best nursing action, but it is the only nursing actions that apply to this scenario. If you don't learn to use the process of elimination, you will struggle greatly answering NCLEX style questions. All right. Does that make sense to you? Go ahead and leave me a comment if that makes sense to you. If you're watching this video later on, leave me some comments as well. That way I can see and review what are the nurses out there thinking when they're analyzing these type of questions. So let's go to another scenario. Here it is. Now, this is a different type of question. It says the nurse is providing care for several clients. So now we're not talking about only one client. We're talking about multiple clients, several clients who are at risk for acid base imbalance. Which client is most at risk for respiratory acidosis. I see on the comment section, some of you commenting that this topic, it is challenging and difficult to understand. Yes, it is, but I'll give you a tip. Go back to the beginning 
of the explanation. Take it one step at a time. Review it again later on because here on the YouTube live, it is very quick because we have to move on. But once everything is done, the whole life transmission is done, go back and review again these topics that I share with you every time I come live. So which client is at most risk for developing respiratory acidosis? So the first thing that we got to see and think about is we probably need a respiratory problem because what are the causes of respiratory acidosis? And we go back to the beginning, to the definition. That is why I share with you the definition. We have something going on either on the function of the lungs or the respiratory system, or there is an alteration in the breathing pattern. So we're looking for a respiratory problem. Number one says 68 year old client with chronic emphysema. Hmm. Respiratory problem, chronic possible answer. And so number two, 58 year old client who uses antiacids every day. Well, I ask you is using antiacids every day. Is that a respiratory problem? Is that a problem of lung functioning or changes in breathing patterns? No, that doesn't make sense. See, a patient that uses antiacids every day or multiple times a day, that patient can develop or has a higher risk of developing metabolic alkalosis, which we will discuss in another YouTube live. So answer number two does not make sense. Answer number three, a 48 year old client with anxiety disorder. Hmm. What an interesting answer. Is anxiety disorder a malfunction or difficulty within the respiratory system? No. But can a patient with anxiety disorder, the breathing pattern, can it be altered? Yes. Yes, we could see that. A patient with high levels of anxiety can develop hyperventilation. And that is altering the breathing pattern. I like answer number three. Let's go to answer number four. It says a 28 year old with salicylate intoxication. Once again, this deals, this deals with metabolic problem. Answer number four, a client that is suffering from salicylate intoxication has the risk of developing metabolic acidosis. So answer number four is eliminate. But now we're stuck. We eliminated two answers, great. But now we have two answers that somehow relates to respiratory problems or changes in the respiratory patterns. And we need to identify which one of these two answers, answer number one or number three, can develop into respiratory acidosis. So let's go back to the beginning. If a patient has chronic emphysema, we know that that patient is going to have alteration in the gas exchange. We know that this patient is not going to be able to exchange, at least not properly, the CO2 and oxygen. And therefore, the patient will not be able to remove as much CO2 from the bloodstream. That can develop respiratory acidosis. So number one makes a whole lot of sense. But what about number three? Because we still have to eliminate answer number three in order to select the correct answer. 
What happens in a patient with anxiety disorder? Let's say the patient has a panic attack and the patient is hyperventilating. What happens with hyperventilation? Too much CO2 is being expelled from the body. The patient is losing a lot of CO2. Oh, if we're losing a lot of CO2, then that can develop respiratory alkalosis, not respiratory acidosis. Answer number three is eliminated. The answer is number one. All right, this is only the beginning. We're halfway. We still got to talk about respiratory alkalosis. So if you want to know the causes, you want to know the nursing interventions, and you want to practice another question, stay in tune for our next section. If you haven't done so, go ahead and like this video. Like this video, share this video with other nursing students, and of course, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, do so. That way you're not missing any of the important information that we share with all of you every week. So, respiratory alkalosis. Let's talk about that. By definition, a description of respiratory alkalosis, a deficit of carbonic acid and a decrease in the hydrogen ion concentration that results from an accumulation of bases. Professor, what does that mean? Well, in respiratory alkalosis, something is going on that the patient is losing hydrogen ions through the respiration, or we're gonna see that it is any condition that causes overstimulation of the respiratory system or changes also in the respiratory patterns. And we talked about a patient with high levels of anxiety, right? Remember that? A patient with severe anxiety, we could see hyperventilation and therefore the patient lost, loses CO2. Well, now you're starting to get the hang of this. So what are some known causes? Fever, hyperventilation, hypoxia, Overventilation by a mechanical ventilator, pain, and of course, severe anxiety and hysteria. But remember what I told you at the beginning of the life? You have to try to understand some whys. Fever? What's the relationship between fever? Fever and respiratory alkalosis. That doesn't sound like a respiratory problem. The problem is that fever causes an increase in metabolism and therefore result in overstimulation of the respiratory system. That is very interesting. Hyperventilation, I think that is very clear, and also overventilation by a mechanical ventilator, that makes sense. Either the patient is breathing too fast, exhaling too fast, or the patient is on a ventilator that the rate assigned or put on the ventilator is going too fast. Now, pain. How come? Why pain can cause a respiratory alkalosis problem? Pretty much for the same reason, overstimulation of the respiratory center, and that can lead to respiratory alkalosis. And we know about anxiety and hysteria. We know about patient having high level of anxiety, why that patient can develop respiratory alkalosis. Now, what are the clinical manifestations? Neurological, cardiovascular, neuromuscular, and respiratory. This is very interesting. So neurological wise, the patient could be lightheaded, confused, dizziness, headache, not too much difference than what we saw in respiratory acidosis. In cardiovascular, we can also see hypotension, tachycardia, 
and dysrhythmias. Now, why the dysrhythmias now? If we talked about dysrhythmia in respiratory acidosis because of hyperkalemia, the reason is in hypokalemia, the patient can also develop dysrhythmias because of the same interchange between potassium and hydrogen ions. Neuromuscular wise, tetany, numbness, tingling of extremities, and hyperreflexia and seizures. And we have respiratory wise, we can see decreased respiratory rate and death. And you may think, wait, 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 one sec. Didn't we just talk about a patient that can develop respiratory alkalosis because he's breathing too fast, hyperventilation? How come you're going to tell me now, professor, that we can see the decreased respiratory rate? We can see decreased respiratory rate as a compensatory mechanism. When the body tries to compensate, we can see the opposite that it is extremely important to understand the question that they are asking. If they're asking about compensatory symptoms or clinical manifestations seen in a problem like respiratory alkalosis when it's not being compensated. So I want to make sure that you understand that respiratory system, when we see decreased respiratory rate, that is a compensatory mechanism in respiratory alkalosis. So what are some nursing interventions? Well, we have to monitor for signs and symptoms of respiratory distress. Again, we have to provide emotional support and reassuring. Now we're dealing more of that anxiety problem that could be causing the alkalosis the respiratory alkalosis. So try to support the patient emotionally, although that is not a primary nursing intervention. Encourage the patient about proper breathing patterns. Slow your breathing. Take a deep breath. Assist with breathing techniques if necessary. Prepare to administer calcium gluconate for tetany as prescribed. And I want to stop here because when you're reading these nursing interventions, you have to think of why. And I think it's self-explanatory why we have to monitor for respiratory distress and why helping with emotional support is good for respiratory alkalosis. We know that why breathing techniques is beneficial, but have you asked yourself, why administration of calcium gluconate? Why tetany? What is the relationship between respiratory alkalosis and tetany and calcium gluconate? Oh, very important. We talked about the exchange, the compensatory exchange between potassium and hydrogen ions. Remember that one? Well, there is also another compensatory exchange in between calcium and hydrogen ion. So we know that in alkalosis, that interchange between calcium and hydrogen ions can lead the patient to develop hypocalcemia. But the thing is that the hypocalcemia is a sputic. It's, it's not really that the, the, the calcium level is low. It is the exchange, the quick exchange in between calcium and hydrogen ions, but it is usually corrected by itself rather quickly. But in emergency scenarios, if we know that the patient can develop hypocalcemia, we need to prepare. We need to have calcium gluconate handy for tetany. That is important. I know that 
this can be a little bit advanced. I'm not trying to make it too complicated for you, but try to understand that there are compensatory mechanisms to try to get to homeostasis and level up the levels of hydrogen and bicarbonate, hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. If the patient is anxious, medicate with an anti-anxiety drug or sedative to control hyperventilation. We see that in respiratory alkalosis, it, we're talking about it is okay with sedative, but we talked in respiratory acidosis that it was not okay. We should avoid them. So it is very important to understand this. And let's go to this question. Let's practice one more question. A patient comes to the emergency room with high levels of anxiety. Hmm. I wonder why. I wonder why they are telling me in this scenario that the patient has high levels of anxiety. Is it important to know? Hmm. Let's see. They're giving us an arterial blood gas. So we have to pull that tic-tac-toe strategy and identify what's going on. The pH is 7.48. The PaO2 is 98. The CO2 is 30. And bicarbonate is 24. Hmm. What do we have? The pH is above normal. So we have alkalosis. The pressure of oxygen is normal. So there's not a oxygen problem going on. The CO2 in this scenario, now it is low because normal is 35 to 45. So whenever the CO2 is low, alkalosis, and the pH is high, alkalosis, then we have respiratory alkalosis. And as you can see, bicarbonate is doing nothing, is in normal range. So we have uncompensated respiratory alkalosis with a normal pressure of oxygen. Which intervention is most appropriate for this client? So this is a priority question. So let's think about prioritization. Let's also think about the process of elimination and look at answer number one. It states, administer oxygen. 10 liters via nasal cannula. As you know, the pressure of oxygen is normal. So does this patient need oxygen? Nope. So another scenario where that oxygen answer is not the correct answer. But also 10 liters, 10 liters per minute via nasal cannula. We know that we can only administer up to six liters via nasal cannula. So two reasons why answer number one is gone, is eliminated. Number two says administer an anti-anxiety medication. Hmm. Does that make sense? Well, it states that the patient has high levels of anxiety. So can the patient benefit from an anti-anxiety medication? Is that helpful in this scenario? Yes, I like it. Answer number three, administer one amp of sodium bicarbonate intravenous push. That's what IBP means, intravenous push. Well, first of all, does it make sense? Didn't we talk about sodium bicarbonate being the drug of choice for metabolic acidosis. But also think about this. Isn't the patient on respiratory alkalosis? So if I give sodium bicarbonate, isn't that going to cause further problem? So answer number three does not make any sense. Answer number four, administer 30 ml of antiacid. Is 30 ml of antiacid going to help with anxiety levels? Is that medication going to help with anxiety levels? 
No. Anti uh, or antiacid is not going to help with respiratory alkalosis. So answer number four is eliminated. The correct answer is number two. I hope that you found this training beneficial. Go ahead and like this video, share it with everyone so everyone can know this critical thinking strategies, this process of elimination, and I wish you all the best. Pass the NCLEX on your next attempt. God bless you all. Bye-bye. See you on the next NCLEX Crusade International live next week. Bye-bye. Blessings.